Hello. Good morning, everybody. I'm Todd Nock. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So today's art live stream, continuing this Iron Man sketch cover that we started yesterday. We did the pencils yesterday. Hopefully you got a chance to see it. If you didn't, it's still here on my YouTube channel, episode 71. We're on episode 72 right now. And I uh, hope everyone's doing well during this COVID season, stay at home time. So um, yeah, so I'm going to walk you through kind of my my tips and tricks with inking, my approach, my thought processes, uh, processes. I, I, I said this yesterday, I'm not sure what the plural of process is. I forgot to look that up yesterday. Um, so I've heard it both ways. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll just share with you some of what, what I'm thinking about and, and tell you kind of what I've been, what I'm thinking about when I do my inks. And um, we'll hopefully get a chance to address some comments and questions. I try to catch the, catch them when I can, but a lot of them, my focus is going into the art. So enough of the intro, let's jump right into the inks. What does my hat say? It says Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. I'm a big fan of the, the, the TV show The Office, uh, the US and UK version. So this is my Dunder Mifflin hat, one of my favorite, favorite caps. And there we go. Clipped back in the rig. Oh, let me bring the light around and um, for uh, the art pens I'll use uh, for my inks my trusty rusty Pigma Micron pens oops I got two zero eights I have the zero eight the zero one and the double zero five and that's what I'll be using to ink with maybe some brush pen later on but for now mostly just these microns so um, so we're just gonna start with the head here and just start putting in the, the main contour outline and then work on some of the inner details. So as I've mentioned in other inking videos, I consider my light source and also depth. Even though Iron Man is here on in, like he's occupying a space here. His hand is closer to us than his forearm, which is, and this, the shoulder guard here is closer to us than that collarbone. So there's slight variation in, in depth that I want to um, be mindful of and uh, also be considering light and shadow. So I'm assuming the light is coming from the, from above, like he's in his armory or lab so more than likely light will be coming from above so places that are further away from the light will get just a little bit of a thicker line like underneath these ear uh, housings just a little bit thicker underneath nice subtle depth pulling a little thicker down the the the, the jaw line do I draw manga? Uh, I, or manga, I've heard it both ways. Uh, I, I do not draw uh, manga. Uh, I, I am an American comic book artist. I, I draw uh, US comics. I have an appreciation for manga or manga, but I have not experienced a lot of it. So I draw in the traditional American or Western style comics, which is what I grew up reading mostly. I had a few manga comics, but not many at all, really. I think I only really had one. I found it at a bookstore and uh, I was very intrigued by the art. It was a book called Grey. And uh, it was like issue three, so I never got, knew the beginning of the story, I never knew how it ended, but I knew that one fight scene in issue three. And that was from like the 1980s, when I was a kid. Who's my favorite comic book artist? Oh, I have tons, tons of favorites. But probably my ultimate favorite uh, I've been a fan of this artist since I was I discovered his art when I was 15 years old. That would be Arthur Adams. Still working in the business today. 
the man's a legend. So he's my, if I had to say who is my one favorite comic book artist, which is difficult to say, but if I had to, to say, I would say Arthur Adams. Look him up on Instagram. You will not be disappointed. If you not, have not seen Arthur Adams' work, artwork yet, look him up. Do a Google search for him. Go follow him on Instagram. You will, I, will, I, I strongly believe you will not be disappointed. I'm creating some metallic fades here. So I'm putting a heavy black here on his collar. Put a little X there to remind myself to fill that in black. And then, uh, so nice big black chunk and then fading it, giving a, the illusion of a metallic fade. Do that a little bit here in the, the shoulder muscles. Now something and this will really come through when I do the colors. The color video is tomorrow. If people start wondering, will I take this to color? Yes, the plan is to do color live stream tomorrow. So in my inks, I am considering what will happen with the colors. So I'm, I, I'm thinking of the light source as it comes down, it's hitting, where's my pencil here? This section here is, will be like the bright light hitting and, and the same here with his head. This will probably, I'll leave a lot of this white for a very bright highlight. It's like this trim rim all the way around him. Uh, that helps convey a metal sort of shine and texture. That's just one of the things I consider when I'm um, inking. Do I own any Arthur Adams original art? I own one piece. Back in uh, the early 2000s when I did my creator owned series Wild Guard, I was able to commission Arthur Adams for uh, a, a, a variant cover for uh, one of my issues of my miniseries. And he drew the cover for uh, Wild Guard Casting Call issue three. He drew a variant cover for that. And uh, I was able to get the original art. Um, he let me have first dibs at the original and it's hanging above my head when I do the intros here on my live streams. So that's the only piece of original art of Arthur Adams that I own. So I switched to the 01 micron here for some thinner, crisper um, inner detail lines. Just kind of thickening up the contours here a little bit. You can always go thicker. If it's too thin, you can always make it thicker, but you, unless you want to use white paint or white out, you can't really go thinner. A little more shadow underneath the chin. Banded metal neck. Love drawing banded metal. Have I ever drawn Toxin, Son of Carnage? I did not know Toxin, Son of Carnage existed. Now that you mention it, I have seen the covers for the Carnage story solicited, but I had not read it, so I didn't realize that Toxin was his son. So it sounds like there's a story out there I need to read. Was that, was he introduced in Absolute Carnage? Am I changing my rendering style to a more classic ink render since I'm drawing classic Iron Man? Uh, no, no I'm not. I'm inking full on regular Todd Knox style inks cause it's what I, what I know best. I want to take classic Iron Man and put him through the Todd Knock current filter. So my approach to drawing him and my approach to inking him is all about how I like to draw. Now I grew up on classic stuff, so so there's there's that kind of influence in my work, but I try to put my present day spin on it, so it kind of walks the line between uh, the classic stuff I grew up with but also some more of, uh, of my modern sensibilities. So it kind of walks this line and, and gives the reader this exper experience of, it looks, it looks present, but it also has a classic 
spirit to it. If I were to ink this in a more classic way, I might use brushes or uh, dip pen nibs like they did to achieve that classic look. But I'm not as well versed in those tools. Now like, I want to do the best work I can for you guys, so I'm using the, the tools I am most proficient at. And that is multi-liners. I'm a multi-liner guy. But great question. Great question. So I'm thinking of his, his metal as a reflective surface. So I approach it as if it were like, like a silvery sort of chrome, even though we know his, his armor is red and yellow. Who's my favorite alternate version of Spider-Man? Uh, Spider-Ham. Been a fan of Spider-Ham since I was a kid. Used to read his comic book in the 1980s when he had his own series on, in, at Marvel's Star Comics. The star line of comics. So I think of each angle of his helmet and of his armor. And let's see, we'll just put a little X there to remind myself to fill that in black later on. Um, so I think of each, each, each plane, each angle. And I think, how would it be reflecting the world around him? So it's like, it's reflecting the horizon. How many comics do I own? I lost count after several thousand so i've been collecting since the night since 1984 when i was a, when i was a kid so I, i've gotten a lot of comics over the past 30 plus years i still read comics today so The collection keeps growing. They're like tribbles. They just they just amass and multiply. So now for each little like like this uh, chest bolt on the underside, I'm thinking of it reflecting the horizon. So I'm doing that little fade. And so I'll just repeat that all through. How did I learn to draw reflective surfaces? Um, just for me, a lot of kind of looking at how other comic artists had done it and then looking at real life and then utilizing my imagination and just merging those three things together with a lot of trial and error. So I'd study how different artists approached it in their different ways and kind of took notes, looked at real life, and uh, studied like, you know, what does is, what is a chrome bumper look like? What do shiny objects look like? A chrome bumper, a shiny new toaster, um, things like that. And then, um, and then just started to kind of craft and develop my own approach to it using, incorporating those two things and then, and then throwing some imagination in there as, uh, as another aspect. And then just, just trying. Now for his helmet, or his face I should say, face part of his helmet. Bringing a few of these kind of reflective lines down through his uh, the temple to his brow to kind of create some shape. Same as well going from the cheekbones, pulling down to the chin. Helps give his face a little shape. I 
Now, since this is not a close-up shot, we will not be able to see his eyeballs inside of his eye slats, nor will we be able to see his teeth in the mouth slat. Just details that would not translate appropriately. I angle the, don't make it an exact rectangle. I make it kind of a little bit more like a rhombus or a quadrilateral type shape where the, the lower part is just a little wider. We kind of slant down towards the bottom line. Kind of gives it a little bit more of a serious frown to it. There's not a lot of life that's given in, in Iron Man's what they call him, old shell head in this uniform, in this uh, armor here. Um, so, uh, so aside from the sculpted metal brow, that's about it. As far as um, expression, his eyes don't really get expressive, his mouth doesn't get really expressive. That's, that's kind of cool. That's uh, just kind of a unique aspect about him. Now bringing in that drafting tool that I used yesterday to draw these, uh, to draw this uh, chest portal. Find that same oval I used. Okay, ink it in. I'm going to slide it down just a little bit so I can get a little bit of a darker line at the bottom. Just a couple of uh, approaches, swipes at the bottom there, so I can get a nice shadow and in the inner portions. And then the innermost, where it tucks right to that line to give a three-dimensional effect. And put in some reflective lines. Put a little shadow on the inner side of the lip here. Then fading it out as we move up. All right, now I need to switch back to my um, 0 0.8 micron here. Where's my uh, French curve? I think I need my French curve now because I want nice, clean curves here to his shoulder guard thingies. So I find the right curve on my French curve. Again, nice, clean, techie line there. Do the same on this side here. What step did I take as soon as I realized I wanted to be a comic book artist? Um, let's see. That's an interesting question, a great question, a very actually very unique question. I've never gotten that question before. I have to think of how I can best answer that. Well, just to give you a little backstory, uh, I was 14 years old when I made my first homemade mini comic book. I took some printer paper, folded it in half, wrote and drew an eight-page comic of my, my creator-owned character, and uh, did it all in one day. Wrote it, drew it, lettered it, everything, and it was really, really bad. <laughs> the story was rough and the art was really pretty ugly, but it was a lot of fun. I had so much fun creating, I knew that night. It's like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to be a comic book artist. So, um, now this was the mid-1980s, so um, 
and I lived in a small East Texas town just outside of Dallas, Texas. So um, we didn't even have a comic book shop. I went to a small school. I was the only kid who really, at that time, collected comic books. So I didn't really have anyone to talk to about it. The internet was not public. So, you know, there was nothing like the uh, YouTube or, the, or social media at all. So pretty much I lived the life of Stranger Things. Have you seen Stranger Things on, um, on Netflix? I relate to that. I was that exact same age at that exact same time in the 1980s. So I pretty much lived what those kids lived, except I didn't have to deal with monsters and other dimensional portals, uh, which I guess is a blessing. Uh, count your blessings. So, hashtag blessed. So I, um, so I just, I just made my own comics. I just made comics. I reverse engineered comics. There was no one to teach me how to do it, so I taught myself just by looking at comics, studying how artists did what they did, and then I tried doing mine. And I just repeated that process over and over and over and over again. I did take art classes in high school when I had electives to utilize. I, I took art classes. I always put it towards art. So my junior and senior year of high school, both semesters, I got to take art, which was amazing. Um, finally, I could draw in class without getting in trouble. So that was nice. And... Um, then when I graduated high school, I started going to art uh, comic book conventions, took my portfolio that my dad had given me f as a graduation gift, and uh, started showing my portfolio at conventions and started getting critiques on my work and learning everything I was doing wrong, and then would take those notes, apply them, and then go back to the next Dallas convention a few months later, because they would have them every four months back in the late 80s through early to mid 90s and uh, go through the process again and again and again. In the early 90s, I realized I needed to go to art school to get better faster so I could achieve my, my dream sooner. So I studied commercial art and graphic design and my art school did not teach anything about drawing comics. So I had to take everything I learned there and apply it to comics. So a lot of how I know how to do what I do for comic books, a vast majority of that was self-taught. Just by observing and replicating, like making my own comics, just trying to do what I saw happening in the, um, in the comic books I was reading, the comic books I love to read. So, so that's my experience. And so that's my encouragement, is if you want to be a comic book artist, try making comics. Just go for it. Come up with an idea. Come up with your own character and start to tell their story. It's going to be rough. It's going to probably look terrible, but you stand a better chance at getting better at it if you start drawing now. Everyone does terrible artwork when they start. You got we jokingly say in the industry, you got to do bad art before you can do good art because it's all about learning. So, because I did not draw like this as a teenager. People ask, how long did it take me to get to this level in my art? The answer is my entire life. Art is a journey. You're gonna learn bit by bit as you go. You're gonna grow bit by bit as you, as you go. You're always learning. Even when I graduated art school, I did not draw like this. I drew like a 22 year old kid. And I learned more. I kept learning. And I still learn. And in probably in 10 years, I won't draw like this. I'll hopefully have learned more tri tricks, learned different ways, tried new, 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 uh, new, new techniques and, and um, ideas. So we're always learning, always growing. So how long does it take to achieve um, your skill level at any given time? Your entire life to get to that point. And then the next years of your life to get to that next point. And there are multiple points. I'd say it's been an infinite number of points. There's just s subtle growth for the most part.
It's essential to have an art degree to work in the art industry. Um, I can't speak for the entire art industry. All I can speak about is comic books because that's the industry I work in. And I graduated from the Art Institute of Dallas, Dallas, Texas, with an Associate of Applied Arts degree in visual communications. And when I got my jobs in comics, either working, getting my first job at Marvel, uh, work, getting hired to work at Rob Liefeld Studio, where I got my big break into the industry and I started working in comics full time, no one ever asked me what my art degree was in. Uh, for comics, and this is just based on my experience, mind you, this is currently just based on my experience, it, the, the criteria is, can you draw well? Can you tell a story visually? And um, can, you, can you meet deadlines? That's, that's what editors are looking for. So, uh, from what I understand, some people uh, have broken into the industry just coming right out of high school. Some people have worked in other industries like animation and, and moved over into comics. Some people have worked in advertising, moved into comics. Some people had a completely different career path. They were studying something completely different in school and switched over to be to try being a comic book artist and got hired because of their art. So it's about skill, uh, being able to tell a story visually, and um, and meeting deadlines, being professional, because these books have to come out on time. And uh, so, you know, I, I felt I needed to go to school to get better art skills. I wasn't even thinking about the degree. I just wanted to get my art skills better sooner, because going, just teaching myself was, I was only leveling up so fast. I figured if I go to art school, I'll have instructors you know, directing me, helping me, and then I can hopefully uh, get better faster. Because um, I don't want to, I, I didn't want to wait any longer to, <laughs> any longer than I had to wait, I should say, to start my career in comics. If I were to be lucky enough and fortunate enough and hashtag blessed enough to um, get a job in comics, because there was no guarantee that would happen either. But I wanted to at least take every shot that I could. So I decided I'm going to go to art school, see what I can learn, and see if I can uh, level up sooner than just trying to do it all only on my own. Because the internet still ha wasn't public yet by the early 90s. I don't think it went public till like 1994. So, um, so I didn't have any other resource. I didn't have YouTube. If I had YouTube tutorials when I was a kid, oh my gosh. Who knows where my artwork would have taken me at that age. Being able to get instruction from professional artists or even really fantastic amateur artists or fan artists, you know, all the different things I could have learned at that time. But, you know, I worked with what I had and that was going to art school and it paid off. One year after I graduated, it was when Rob Liefeld hired me and I moved to California and started my career. So art school definitely, definitely was a good, good um, opportunity for me because it didn't just teach me how to get better at art, but it taught me how to do projects because every art, every class was a different art project and there was a deadline. Each uh, quarter was 11 weeks. So I had 11 weeks to do five different projects because there were five classes, a different class each day of the week. And so it taught me how to manage my time. It taught me how to know what I could do in a certain amount of time so that when I got into comics and I was given a, a comic book deadline, I knew how to manage my time because that's a big factor in drawing comics. It's because we don't work in the Marvel offices. We all work in our own studios all over the world. So, uh, you know, there are artists in the U.S., Canada, Europe, Asia, South America. So, you know, it, it's like they're everywhere. Every, almost, you know, so many countries have comic book artists 
drawing for Marvel and DC and other publishers. So we've got, kind of got to be our own boss, you know? Our editors will, might email us saying, hey, do you have those pages ready? But if you don't have them ready, yikers. That's really going to mess up the schedule and that's not going to make for a great work environment, you know? We all got to work together as a team to get these books done, done well. So, so art school helped me not just to get better at art, but to get better with time management and knowing what I could do with my skills and how to, to know how to get a job done in time, which I think is really critical because time frames are a big, big portion in comics. Deadlines are a big portion in, I think, most art industries, whether it be publishing or creating stuff for TV shows, movies, advertising, there are deadlines. This stuff has to come out at a certain time. So it's not just about being able to draw pretty pictures, it's being able to get the job done on time. And if you blow too many deadlines, you might not have too long of a career in that industry. So that was a really great benefit for art school to, for me, uh, which I didn't even really realize at the time was that it was teaching me how to manage my time and become confident in my skills to be able to get things done in a timely fashion. I didn't realize that experience was actually teaching me something I didn't even know I needed, but was critical for my industry. Yeah, let's see. Uh, some people are saying they live in other parts of the, the, the world. Yes, Marvel and DC and, and, and Image and, and, and Dark Horse and Boom, those are U.S. comic book companies. But if there are sometimes um, those publishers um, will send their editors to international comic book conventions to scout out new talent. So always keep up with the publisher's convention schedules. Now, I know that because of COVID nobody's really hosting comic book conventions right now, but that gives you time to prepare your samples because representatives from these publishers will, could be coming to a convention near you or kind of near you. And that's when you can get a chance because I know artists who, who work in you know, all sorts of different countries who draw for Marvel and, 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 and DC, like uh, Mahmoud Esrar, uh, I believe he's from Turkey, as well as Yildre Sinar is from Turkey as well. Uh, let's see, a lot of guys from South America, like Rod Reese, Joe Prado, Evan Reese. Uh, they're all from um, Brazil. Uh, there's Mexico, like Umberto Ramos and Paco Medina. Um, I mean, so many Canadians. Marcus Toe, Francis Manipul, Carl Kershaw, Jim Zub. So, so many people from, from, uh, from Canada, people from England, you know, so, uh, so there's a chance. It's just, is, is an editor going to be near your, near you? You might have to, might be a bit of a travel, might be a bit of a trek to get that, co to that convention near you, but, um, hopefully they're, they're, they're somewhat close. But the, the most important thing, I think a, a key, one, not the most, but a key important aspect is have your sample pages ready to show. Have your pan sample pages ready to take to a convention. If you really want to be a comic book artist, be working on your pages daily. And you'll be like, daily? Yes, daily. Because if you're fortunate enough to get into the comic book industry, that's what you'll be doing daily. Now, I know some people have to go to school, some people have to work. I had to do the same thing. I sacrificed a lot of social interactions so I could go to school, work my job, and work on comic book stuff, work on my comic book art separately. You know, I had to get all my coursework done at, at art school, but I still had to find time to work on my comic book stuff. 
So I didn't really do a lot outside of work, school, and draw comics. Now I would, you know, I'd see friends at school and at work, and occasionally I would get together with friends, but I spent a lot of weekend nights at home working on my art because I wanted to be ready. I knew there would be more comic book conventions coming up. I needed to have my artwork ready for that. So I wanted to have the best artwork I could show every time. What was my job during that time? I worked at a movie theater. I worked at a movie theater in Dallas. And I, I tore tickets at the door. I sold popcorn. I sold tickets in the box office. Those little X's to show me to fill those in black in a little bit. So that, that was my, my job when I was working or when I was going to school in Dallas. I worked at the Inwood Movie Theater, if there are any people from Dallas watching. Don't know if the Inwood Movie Theater is still, still around, but I worked there back in 1991 and 1992. Let's see, what's the best way to uh, create sample pages? Um, there, I, there, are, there are three different ways you can approach this. One, which is how I kind of started doing my sample pages when I was a teenager, uh, well, late teen, when I graduated high school and started taking my samples to, to Marvel, or to conventions to show Marvel editors who are always there, is to come up with an all new three, five page sequence. I would come up with, you know, I take whatever character I wanted to draw, come up with a three to five page sequence. And I would draw it up, an all new little short story. It wasn't even a full story, it was just, here's a, here's a scene. Show some action, show some talking, show backgrounds, maybe show a vehicle. Then, um, and you know, that's what I did most of the time. You can't, if you cannot think of a five page or a three to five page sequence to, to draw, then grab a comic book and recreate that a, a scene in your style. Now here's how to do that. There's a specific way I believe one should do that. One, don't pick up a comic drawn by your favorite artist. Do not grab a Jim Lee Batman comic. Do not grab that one. Grab a different Batman comic if you want to draw a Batman scene. Draw a Batman comic drawn by someone who is not your favorite artist because you don't want to be influenced by what your favorite artist has done. Take that comic, pick the five, three, three to five page sequence. Make sure, you know, it can have an action scene, but also make sure there's a, a talking scene. So, uh, uh, pick a part of a scene that transitions to the beginning of another part of a scene. So you can show your editor, you can the editor, that will hopefully become your editor, that you can draw action and talking. So a scene where it's maybe Bruce Wayne talking to Commissioner Gordon, and then it, it transitions to a scene of Batman fighting Killer Croc or whatever. So, so take that comic, look at what's happening on, on the page. Start making notes. Don't write down panel one, this is happening. No, don't do that. Don't even write down panels because you don't. that doesn't matter. Write down what exactly you're seeing happening on the page. Batman or Bruce Wayne talks to Commissioner Gordon in the office. Commissioner Gordon looks concerned. Bruce Wayne reassures him. Uh, Bruce Wayne leaves. The next scene is uh, now B Batman is in the Batmobile. Batman pulls over. Batman opens manhole cover. Batman drops down in the sewer. Batman is attacked by Killer Croc. Whatever it is, you know, just start writing down specifics of what you're seeing. Now put that comic book away. Put it far away from you and never refer to it again. Now draw that scene your way. In fact, wait a day so you can start to forget what you just looked at 
and draw something brand new with that information. Because when you get your plot, you're getting a text story written by the writer. You're not going to have another person's comic book art to look at and recreate in your style. You've got to retell that story in your way. So, so I, I, and I've done that. That's how I got hired at DC. I took um, uh, a three-page Legion of Superheroes sequence, did that exercise. I, I jotted down what was happening on, the, on, the, on those pages, put the comic book away, and then drew it up my way. And that's what got me hired at DC, starting off uh, at in the Legion of Superhero office, because they liked the, the, the samples I had most recently sent in, and that was the technique I had used. Um, so, so that's how I suggest that. Now, I said that there's a third approach to having sequential art to show an editor. And uh, this is um, something to keep in mind, especially in this day and age of creator-owned comics. Make a creator-owned comic. Come up with your own creator-owned character, write and draw your story, and you can just show the pages. If you are able to, they have one-off printing now, where you can have however many copies you can afford to have printed, printed up. Print up copies. It can be an eight-page story, it could be a 20-page story, anything, you know, like that. And you have that to hand off to an editor, that speaks volumes. That tells them that, you, you know, you're giving them a comic book experience. You're giving them, a the editor, uh, an idea of what it's like to read a, insert your name here, comic book. And then they can imagine, wow, this, you know, based on this comic book I'm seeing, I could really imagine this guy on Spider-Man or Moon Knight or Green Lantern, you know, depending on who the editor is you're showing it to. So you're giving them an experience, number one. Number two, you're showing them you have the drive and passion to see a project all the way through, which is important. And three, you're giving them a takeaway. You're giving them something to take home with them, take back to the office with them, maybe show to other editors. So, um, and also, you have now developed your own property. And in this day and age where something like The Walking Dead can get a multi-season hit-run TV show on AMC, and then if you're like Robert Kirkman, you own that property, you own all the rewards of that property. So, uh, so creating your own, create your own property can be a benefit in so many ways. So any one of those those three approaches can help you get um, get product that you can show off at a convention in hopes of scoring a job. At what point did I, in pursuing my art, did I find my art style? My art style, I think, was always there with me. It's just it kind of developed over time more and more and more and more and just kind of refined. I mean, definitely influenced by my favorite artists, such as Arthur Adams and Rick Leonardi, Walter Simonson, Alan Davis, and so many, many more through the 80s and into the 90s when I was kind of just getting start started and kind of formulating. But a lot of it came just by just... I say not to, a lot of people get frustrated. I meet them at conventions, they go, I just can't find my art style. I've been working and working so hard at it, and I just can't seem to find it. And it's like, yeah, you know, something to consider is sometimes we don't find our art style, our art style finds us. Our art style is in many ways based on the ways we like to make lines and shapes because that's what this is. I'm making lines and shapes. And how do we like doing that? Some of it's based on the lines and shapes we've seen other artists draw that we find appealing, which is totally natural and understandable and common. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but then how we do it, how, we, how our style kind of develops is how we do that when we do that over and over and over and over again. So I think a lot of my art style developed more so when I became a comic book artist. Like it started to solidify because I had to 
find the way to draw what I needed to draw in a timely fashion. I think having deadlines and, and you have to make choices can be an aspect that helps define one's art style. The efficiency of line, as we call it. I think that's another aspect of our style, is that it, part of it is built on the efficiency of line. And when I say that, it's like, uh, gosh, it's almost maybe, maybe a bit difficult for me to find the right way to put the words into it. Uh, but how we choose to make our shapes and how we know when we're done, I guess, is, might, be, might be the simplest way to say it. I think I saw a, a, um, a question about drawing, someone's having trouble drawing uh, their superhero body proportions, and if I can do videos on that. You know, these types of videos are pretty much what I do in that regard. Um, I would say, look into a life drawing book, instructor book, like um, some of the classes, classics are Bern Hogarth, Andrew Loomis, and George Bridgman are probably three of the most popular ones. Start studying those, or the like, and apply what you learn there to comics. So start, the more we learn on how to draw real life, we can then start to push and exaggerate real life into the dynamic Marvel or DC styles. So keep studying real life and uh, anatomy whenever possible, and then you exaggerate that. And if you've ever seen the book, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, they address that. John Buscema, the artist of that book, shows how he draw, how a real punch looks in real life. And then he shows this step-by-step -step progression of how you can exaggerate that to the point of the, the mighty Marvel style. It's where it's, it's not, it's not... Because a normal punch in real life is not as dynamic as what we would see Thor or the Hulk or the Thing do. Jack Kirby really uh, did a great job in showing us how that can be super exaggerated. So those would be some of my tips into looking at those books. And keep watching my videos and hopefully some of the things I do here will kind of help you get... Uh, some ideas and tips and tricks on how to approach drawing your, your superheroes and muscles and such. Switching back to the zero one, a finer, I need that finer tipped micron so I can get these fine details of the banded metal that runs along his fingers and hands. The 08 would be too big and would make it too muddy. And maintaining that curve around the forearm. Always want to make sure I maintain that shape. So I think in terms of horizon lines and vanishing points, when I'm doing my backgrounds, when I'm drawing buildings and such, absolutely. Absolutely. Here on this figure work, not so much. Not to say that there isn't perspective, because there is perspective as the arm comes down, goes back up to the body, especially this hand here. Um, maybe some artists might think in that way in, in this type of in illustrating this type of stuff, but but I don't. Art uh, yesterday in the pencil stage, but here for the inks, I want to use a nice circle temp or ellipse template so I get a nice clean ellipse right there. Now let's see. Drawing the reflection, kind of runs down the center of his fingers. Still using the 0-1 micron for some nice crip lines.
Let's see, someone says it's laggy and, and your YouTube is getting paused. Oh, hold on, let me try something real quick and make sure we didn't leave that, uh, that on. Hopefully it hasn't been laggy or blurry this entire time. If so, we probably lost this video as well, but uh, hopefully that helps. All right, so sorry about that. I had to make sure um, we keep the, uh, the TV Roku off. So we'll just finish this out and then I'll see how this all translates. If it's all blurry, has it been blurry for you? Okay, cool. Hopefully it won't turn out blurry on my end when I see the, if I see it's uploaded blurry, then I'll, um, I might have to delete this video. Don't know why our Roku finally, or all of a sudden started interfering with my live streams. Hasn't done that in the past six and a half weeks, and then here on week seven and eight, it's been bugging. So keeping these banded metal curving around the finger, I'm thinking of the, the shape and the form and the volume of the finger. And I do this for every element that I draw. Now for this meaty part of the hand, I'm considering the shape and how do these lines pull across. These are things that comic book artists thinks, think about over and over and over and over again. To where we think about it so much, it's second nature. That's why we say practice. When people go, how do I get better? Practice. It's, it's I think, something you'll hear every pro say because it is the truth. You gotta practice it. It's like your drills, you know? Like if you're in sports, you do sports drills. You do, you do uh, laps and burpees and, and um, all those other sports-related <laughs> um, exercises that I cannot think of because I have not been in a sport since I was in high school. Um, and I wasn't even really in much of sports at that time to begin with. But it's like that mentality where you, 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 you train, you're training. You're thinking all the time. Because being a comic book artist, we are a storyteller. We want to draw pretty pictures. But we're also problem solvers. We're puzzle solvers. Every page, every figure, it's like putting together a puzzle. And how do we make everything fit? And fit to the best of our ability. How can we make it fit and work well? And so we tra it's not just training to be a good artist, but training, training our brain. You know, our brain is trained to, to deal with whatever it is we have to draw. And sometimes, like if y'all saw me doing the pencils, this is a, my third attempt to get this pose down. I, st I started one, didn't like it, erased it. Started another, didn't like that, erased it. Started on this third one and finally got something going that I felt good about. There are times where I'll spend, I don't, I don't even know how long, and I know other artists will do this too, just because it's the nature of being human, is to just like sometimes it's just not working. And you, it's like, I can't believe I spent an hour trying to get this arm right. Sometimes we have those days. It's not about drawing it perfectly first time you put a uh, pencil to paper. Sometimes it's like, ah, I just can't quite seem to get this one thing to fit right. And it's, it's struggling with the puzzle of it all. And that's just a natural thing. So if you ever feel that way, know that you're not alone. It happens to everybody because it's, it's puzzle building and sometimes the puzzle is challenging. That's just natural. But you got to stick with it. You got to keep working at it. You got to find a solution to that puzzle. 
as to the as best as you can. Sometimes it means coming up with a whole new approach, like I did yesterday. I took three different approaches to find this pose. I didn't didn't stick with that. For, take that first uh, pose and do it three different times trying to get it right. I just like ah, no no. I'm going to try something different. So, and that's okay. Sometimes it's good to try something completely different. Sometimes you you got the pose that you know you need to do, but it's. It's just taken a bit to figure out just the right approach to get that one pose down. Sometimes I change camera angles. Maybe that's the solution. Maybe it's sometimes I just got to slog through it and find the way to draw that arm and get it, get it, at the very, very least, good enough. Even if it's not perfect, is it good enough? And sometimes we don't even know what we're doing is actually better than what we think it is. I tell this story all the time of there was this time I was having to draw this one scene in the comic and I just could not, I just didn't feel it was working right. I wasn't able to get it the way I thought I wanted. But you know, the deadline was coming and I thought, okay, this works. It, 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 fits, the, it fits the need, I think, of the story and uh, it conveys the information needed and I'm, I'm just going to, um, you know, I got to get these pages turned in and, you know, it's not bad. It's not, it's not as perfect as I thought I wanted it to be. And it's like, oh, I hope I don't get dinged for this. Hope I haven't disappointed my editor. Well, you know what? I turn the pages in, FedEx delivers them. Like a day or two later, my editor calls me up and he's raving about the pages I sent. And the one page he likes the most, the one panel he likes the most, is the one I was most frustrated with and felt like maybe I missed the mark. And I'm like, holy moly, my editor liked that panel. That is wild. Well, if I've learned anything right now is that maybe, you know, is, the one thing I learned is that just because I see it one way doesn't mean that other people might see it another way. So maybe I shouldn't be so hard on myself to the point of frustration. That's where I started to learn to change my focus in my art, to stop being so perfectionistic, but to know that sometimes it takes a fresh eye to see what's right or wrong about a page. And I can be that fresh eye if I allow myself to take the time to um, take a break and step away and not just try to force something. Not to say I was forcing it then, but sometimes you feel like, ah, I'm forcing this. All right, so now we got these, um, these uh, hip discs here. So I'm, I'm considering, like this is the horizon and um, it fades down. So this would be the sky and this would be like the kind of the horizon and the environment or the world around them. In fact, I'm going to use my, uh, my, um, French curve. French curve is the word I'm looking for. Sorry, it's still early in the morning for me here in, uh, Southern California. So I want to get a nice fade from light to dark. So I, apply less pressure and then more pressure as I approach what will be a black area right here. This technique came with a lot of practice. To learn how to get my micron to give a thin to thick line. Doop, just like that. So it kind of creates this fun little, uh, fun little fade right there. And then this whole section I will fill in with black here pretty soon. Let's see, we'll fill that in black. Now I need to put the banded metal in his shorts here. I'm going to use my um, French curve again. For some nice clean banded metal lines to run across his shorts. I'm 
Okay. So let's see. I think we're good now to um, do a light erasing and then we can fill in the blacks with brush pen. So I'm going to take, right now I'm going to take my kneaded eraser. You saw me at LA Comic Con last year. Oh, yeah? I was only there just doing my Peter B. Parker cosplay. I was not exhibiting at LA Comic Con last year, so you probably saw me in cosplay, which was a lot of fun. Took a lot of fun pictures with other cosplayers. It's one of the last few times I got to be, do my Peter B. Parker. Oh, you dressed up as uh, Peter B. Parker for Halloween. Yes, I was Peter B. Parker for Halloween as well. I guess that was the very last time. In fact, I was got to be Peter B. Parker at the Marvel offices because I was at Marvel, I was in New York for a meeting uh, that this past Halloween. So I got to go to the Marvel offices and visit on Halloween day. So I went, many, many of the editors and staff were there um, in costume. And uh, so I went... You know, I thought, I'll play along too, and I went as Peter B. Parker, and um, they actually asked me to be a guest judge for the Marvel Office Costume Contest, which was, which was fun. Very unique experience. I would have never thought, as a teenager, that one day I would be at Marvel Office, dressed up as a version of Spider-Man, guest judging an office con uh, costume contest. I can check that off my bucket list. Now I'm using the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen to fill in the blacks. Uh, is the, the ink in the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen water-soluble? You know what? I don't know. I've never run a test. For a comic for the covers, uh, for comic book covers, how many, uh, how long is the deadline that I get for those? Uh, it can vary. Most of the time I get at least a week. I've gotten as many as five weeks to get a cover done, which was glorious. Um... Uh, but I, I've done, uh, usually, uh, I think on average is about a week to two weeks. Marvel likes to stay, or from my experience, Marvel likes to stay ahead on those deadlines. Um, you know, they, they uh, oftentimes those are for variant covers, so they know the, the theme of the variant cover that they're looking for, so they start hiring artists to do the different themes for the, the different covers for the theme for the different books, like Gwen Stacy month or 2099 month, things like that. So on, on average, it's about a week to two weeks at least, which is great. And usually I, 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 I'm able to get a cover um, usually penciled in about a day and then inked in a day or two. And then pass that on to the colorist and my colorist Rochelle has plenty of time to Oh, uh, we got people harassing people here. We got some trolls. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look into see about uh, yeah about getting a moderator. Um, but we'll we'll um, we'll deal with that right now. For those of us who are here to um, uh, for the art, let's uh, let's just keep focusing on this and not that, and um, and I will be good. How about that? You just ate your dinner. <laughs> Take it you're not here in the US.
Sorry about that, gang. My wife was texting me about some stuff we were shipping out. I confused her with leaving a piece of paper with the receipts on there, which she needed clarification about because we don't usually have that. Ah, it's a whole big technical thing about my shipping process there that I forgot to clue her in on, so that was my bad. Do I think of the year 2099, all the Marvel characters will be drawn in their 2099 costumes? Right, so will the Marvel Universe finally merge into the 2099 future that we've been reading about since the mid-1990s? You know, that's an interesting question. I don't think I will be alive by then. I would be well over 100 years old in the year 2099. And I mean, like, significantly old. I mean, I'd probably, in 2099, I'd be 120 something. So I don't know if I'd be alive at that point. So I don't, I would not be, get to be a part of transitioning the Marvel Universe into its 2099 future. You know what? Uh, that would be interesting. It would be interesting to see what Marvel does. And I'm ashamed that I, I, I feel, I'm not ashamed, I feel sad. I'm not ashamed. There's no shame in that. But, you know, I'll probably have passed on by then. But, um, may I rest in peace. Uh, but it will be, it'll be a little sad that I won't get to be around to see that. To see what happens with that. But I'm sure for those of you who are alive at that point, and if this video is still on YouTube in the future, and uh, even after I'm long gone, and you're watching this and it's the year 2098, you will know what happened to the Marvel Universe when it hits when it catches up to 2099. Oops, and this part's supposed to be filled in black. Oh, and that one too. Oh, and right there under the neck. So easy to forget or miss a black that needs to get spotted. Oh yeah, Iron Man 2020. Yeah, they brought him into it because it's 2020 now. Why didn't Iron Man 2020 warn us about COVID back in the 1980s when he was introduced? Why was he keeping that secret? What nefarious reason could he have? Oh, I see another one. It's almost like a game here. Find the blacks that I need to fill in. Okay. So I think that's just about got it here. Actually, I want to go through here and pump up some of the blacks, thicken some of the contours here. Because he's a villain. Right. Right. At least he could have been like a bro. You know, it's like, come on, man. Don't worry about the butterfly effect. We got COVID to deal with. Let's get a jump on that. It's mostly here on the outer contours of the leg, some of the the darker parts of the muscles, just beefing up the black lines there. Can't wait to see the color, right on. I can't wait to color this, but I have to wait. That's tomorrow's live stream. So yeah, I'll be doing the Copic color tomorrow at 9 a.m. Right about 9 a.m. Pacific, I should say, right here on my channel. So make sure that you are subscribed to my uh, my YouTube channel here, and your notif notifications are set to alert you, so that you can um, join me live. Especially if you've just discovered my channel here, maybe just today. Welcome. Thanks for joining all of us, longtime viewers. So glad you're here with me every day. 
during this COVID-19 stay-at-home season. Can't believe this is the middle of week eight. Where does the time go? It's hard to believe it's been eight weeks of weekday live streaming. Okay, just a little bit more here, a few more little touches, and I think we are good with old Shellhead. All right. Awesome. Let's pull back so you can see the full Iron Man so far. We're in the middle of the seventh week. Is this week seven? I thought this was week eight. I have no concept of time. But somehow I still meet my deadlines, thankfully. Yeah, I thought this was week eight. There we go. So tomorrow we will color this bad boy up. We'll, we'll even put in some sort of background. I've already been thinking about what to do with the background and that will be a lot of fun. So let's flip the camera around here and we can uh, wrap up today's art live stream. Ah. Oops. Uh, yeah, there we go. All right. Clip back into the rig. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging with me. Thanks, uh, thanks for the generous advice and, and, and uh, entertaining stories. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed my advice slash stories. Thank you so, so much. Um, thanks for joining me from all over the world. I appreciate that, everybody. I hope you're staying all, I hope, let me try this a sentence. This a sentence? Let me try that sentence again so I can try the other sentence again. I need to start over from scratch. This is live TV, people. Live TV, we're working without a net. Because that's just the way it is. A net just never shows up to help me with these live streams. But somehow I still keep her on the payroll. Um, actually, she's staying home because, you know, stay at home order. Sorry, Annette, you can't come into work. Uh, you never come into work anyway, so no change in life for you. Um, for those of you that don't know, Annette is this running joke of this person who's supposed to help me with my with my live streams, but never shows up because she doesn't really exist. Because I'm working without Annette. <laughs> dad jokes. I love them. I love them. I'm not a dad, but I still love to tell dad jokes. So, what was what was I talking about before I flubbed all my lines? And because uh, the cue cards are a mess over there, setting up your own cue cards not not easy to do. Um, <laughs> Hopefully you're staying well. That's it. Hopefully you're staying well during this COVID-19 season. I got a hair sticking out way out from underneath my cap. Uh, my hair is so long. I haven't had a haircut in like two and a half weeks. Look at this. Look at this mess. Look at this. This is crazy hair. <laughs> it's kind of fun, but oh man, I'm not used to it being this long. I really look forward to getting a haircut. So I had to, had to tamp it down with my Dunder Mifflin cap. I don't know why I had to go all Texan there. So hopefully you're staying safe and well. This 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 uh, live stream is really <laughs> this wrap up is going off the rails. Uh, tomorrow, join me, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern, 4 p.m. Greenwich time. In case you're international, calculate your time zone, and from there, and also just subscribe to my channel. Tap the, no the little bell to set your notifications to alert you for when I schedule my live stream, so that you don't miss out. It also alerts you when I upload art videos um, as well. So. Um, yeah, tomorrow, 9 a.m. Pacific, we will color up this uh, Iron Man here with Copic sketch markers. And I'm very excited to start coloring this bad boy. I think it's going to be a lot of fun uh, coloring up these shiny yellow and red metal textures. Uh, gang, 
Thank you so much for um, joining me. Thanks so much for hanging out. Hopefully you learned some tips and tricks, had a good time, and hopefully uh, you can join me here tomorrow. So um, uh, stay safe, stay well. I'm Todd Knock. Keep on drawing, keep having fun. Take care.